So we have um, the beginning of module six here. Um, and I think there's two announcements I wanted to bring up. Um, first one is uh, at the end of this session, which will finish up in about an hour and a half, um, we will have a class photo. Um, so it'll be very quick um, and it'll be a, a Zoom picture. Um, so it'll be screenshots. Um, if you don't want your um, image on, you, you don't have to, um, but obviously for a class photo, it's important to get your video camera on uh, so that we can see you. Um, so we'll, we'll remind you just before we wrap up. The other thing I want to remind or talk to people a little bit about is, and, and we've been seeing this already, um, the, um, the lab sessions um, are intended to, and especially today, now that everyone I think is kind of up to speed with machine learning and the terminology, uh, is to start asking the TAs and to start asking myself um, about your work, your problems. Um, that's partly why we're here. It's partly why the course is obviously being offered. And it's partly why we asked you guys at the very beginning uh, about your own work and how you think you could use machine learning. Um, and, and this is something that's happened in other, you know, when we've given this course before, is that typically people are kind of, um, you know, struggling with the concept for the first day. They're kind of getting acquainted with the terminology, the ideas, the concepts. The second day, they start getting a little more familiar, a little more comfortable with it. People are speaking the same language. And this is the time really to start asking uh, us about your problems. Some of them are, you know, perhaps very simple things to ask and answer. Others are fairly complicated and, and might require more detail. Um, obviously, you know, you can do the labs, you can do the exercises, um, but they're not intended to be that difficult. And at this stage, um, some of them are more of just, oh, gee whiz, I can do that now, or sorting out some of the challenges with CoLab. But that's, um, these really weren't intended to, um, you know, occupy your time. They were really, um, I think, to help inspire people to say, okay, I get it now. Um, how can I do it to help me? And how can this work for my work or my lab or my project? So certainly for the next two labs, uh, I really encourage people to do that. Uh, ask your TAs anything. Um, and uh, certainly they're all really bright. They'll probably give you guys some very useful answers. Uh, in some cases, some very useful collaborations have started. Um, and uh, hopefully that helps you guys with your, your own research. Okay, um, I'm going to dive into module six now, uh, same slides as per usual. So we're going to be learning about Keras and scikit-learn today. Uh, we're going to spend both module six and module seven on these ones. Uh, the lectures will take up the most of the time. The labs will be relatively short, which, as I say, is a good opportunity for you guys to start asking your TAs in the breakout rooms uh, and myself, either during the, the lectures or when I drop in. Uh, about some of your own work. So um, obviously we're introducing scikit-learn and Keras, I've mentioned that before. And the reason why we're doing this is to show you how the code that we'd spent so much time uh, explaining and which uh, other people in my group had written, had spent so much time writing in pure Python and, and NumPy uh, are much easier, much shorter and um, some cases even better when you write this using scikit-learn and Keras. And we're going to show some specific examples. We're going to take the iris classification problem that was done with decision trees written all in NumPy and Python and show how uh, easy it is with scikit-learn. And then we're also going to do the same thing with the neural net iris classifier and show the same thing. So what is scikit-learn? You could call it all, also sklearn. And that's probably how I'll refer to it more often. So it's an open source library uh, in Python, and it has these algorithms for machine learning. So you can implement decision trees, you can implement random forests, um, and a number of other um, standard techniques. It's been around for about uh, 13 years, and it's um, a very, very popular library. It's not the only one. Um, and you can click on this particular link, it's in your website, to, to get um, you know, a bit more information about the history and the development and, and what's going on, news and other things. 
Now that's scikit-learn. And then there's another thing called Keras and then another thing called TensorFlow. So TensorFlow uh, was a deep learning framework that Google created, and that was done about seven or eight years ago. And Keras is a neural network library specifically for TensorFlow. So scikit-learn was for you know, decision trees, random forests, SVMs, but TensorFlow and Keras are really for the neural net stuff. Um, they have application programming interfaces or APIs or apps uh, to develop and evaluate um, standard artificial neural nets, ones that we've been using, and deep neural nets, which have you know, multiple layers and um, which are sometimes very much more sophisticated, you know, these convolutional neural nets, or recurrent neural nets, or graphical neural nets. And again, we've given you a link to TensorFlow if you wanted to learn more about these things. So TensorFlow got its name because it's named after tensors, and tensors are a fancy name for matrices, or arrays, or vectors. Um, so TensorFlow also uh, makes use of computer graphs, computational graphs that allow you to visualize some of the mathematical processes. Uh, the graphs are um, things that contain um, units of computation or operation objects. Um, and the tensors are the objects that represent data that flow between those operations. Uh, within the whole graph structure, um, you have a session. So this is sort of visualized here, and, and if you're a computer geek, this may make some sense to you. Most of us, it's a little, a little obscure. But anyways, you've got a data flow graph. You've got nodes in the graph that are connected to edges, just like we talked about with decision trees. Um, each node is an operation, just as I said before, so it's a mathematical operation, so circles, and then the edges are the data sets in which the operations are performed, so the data flows through that. Um, and so that's basically how you typically understand most operations, that's how you'd probably describe a, an algorithm in many cases. Um, this is also how you can describe the graphs in TensorFlow. So the edges, which are those arrows, are the tensors, and the nodes, the circles, are the operations. Um, and then the graphs, which describes the whole connection of those nodes and edges, um, forms a session. Anyways, it's just, uh, again, it's a conceptual thing, it, it's something you probably don't have to care about too much uh, in terms of if you just want to get programming done and things solved. But that's just explaining sort of the origin of the name. So um, when we talk about Python, we've got um, various modules uh, that can contain um, functions. Uh, we've given some that contain a group of functions or classes. And then there are obviously variables and variable names, which are what you standardly use in a, in a program. Uh, we've seen how you can call some of these functions. Um, that helps you save on code. Um, and um, we've also used NumPy and Pandas, uh, which also made some of the mathematical operations and data handling easier. So we would import NumPy and import Pandas. That, that made some of our work a lot easier. So Keras contains classes and functions just like Python. Um, that allow you to create um, things for um, especially neural nets, artificial neural nets, deep neural nets. And sklearn contains the classes and functions that allow you to do a lot of the preparation uh, on data sets and creating models for the decision trees in random forests. So sklearn for decision trees in random forest, I think for SVMs, and then Keras for those neural net things. How do you get TensorFlow to work? So we, we were, you know, how did we get Pandas and NumPy? Well, we saw how to do that. Um, in Colab, you type in pip install TensorFlow. That's a command. And pip is what's called a recursive an acronym. So pip installs packages, P-I-P. -P. Um, so it's just bringing in those packages or that module um, so that you can do 
TensorFlow, which means that you can do things like sklearn. All right, so that's the setup. That's just giving you some background and rationale for um, sklearn and, and TensorFlow and, and Keras. So we're going to use um, the Iris decision tree. So that means you use sklearn, not Keras, because Keras is the neural nets. sklearn is for decision trees and, and random forests and SVMs. Um, so in this case, again, uh, when we wrote the decision tree yesterday, um, we used the NumPy and Pandas. Um, and that was imported into the Iris DT4, which you guys used and ran. And in this case, uh, we're going to use uh, sklearn uh, with its own function um, called decision tree classifier. That's how it's written. And that is uh, the thing you call. So that's sort of the preface before we start. Um, obviously, with every machine learning workflow, um, there's these six steps or defining a problem. So our problem, as before, was how do I classify iris, flower, iris flowers based on their floral dimensions? It's exactly the same problem we had with the original decision tree. We get our data set. And in this case, it's the same one that we've talked about, Setosa, Virginica, Versicolor, 50 of each, a total of 150. We measure petal and sepal dimensions. The same data set published in 1936. Um, and again, everyone kind of knows these now. We have to transform our data set. Well, in fact, because it's a decision tree, we don't, but we just put it into a nice table so it's easier to read. Uh, and we've got our labels on the column under species and our petal dimensions and these other four columns. So it's a five column, 150 rows. We do exactly the same thing that we've done before. Uh, we pop up module six. Um, we open on the uh, Iris decision tree sklearn in Python. And I think it's important at this stage just to remind people what the algorithm was like last, last time. So we had a, a function to read the data. We checked the data. We created the training set that was 70% you know, and the testing, which was 30%. We had a splitting function, which you know, made a decision about how to split data, um, split the um, um, a function or a group based on our decision. We used the Gini index calculator to essentially assess um, what was the um, best splitting point. Uh, we had a split function. We had a way to determine when we reached the terminal node. And then we had to be able to do this recursively because we're always cutting, 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 we're making decisions. And then we also wanted to make a program that would be able to um, take any new input data and run it through the decision tree. So that had, I don't know, 10 steps. This one, if we use the new um, decision tree algorithm with sklearn, it's simpler. We just read the data using a function called sklearn datasets. Then we call a split function, which is train test split. Then we call decision tree classifier, and then we repeat four times, which is what our choice of maximum depth is. So 10 steps to four steps, calling essentially a whole bunch of pre-written functions. And we still have to do um, some math. Uh, so we still have to import uh, NumPy, and we still have pandas to help read some of our data. So the sklearn datasets function is now what we use to read. Um, and um, these are the, the, the commands. So it's you know, six commands, pretty simple. Um, and the datasets function is the way that we read our data. Um, we have a training and testing set. Um, and um, we can import the training test split method. So it gets the training, produces the testing. 
And again, it's just a, a function call. Um, and then obviously we've already chosen the decision tree, so it's not as if we have to choose our model. Um, but because sklearn has um, the decision tree classifier as its function, we just call it. So we import decision tree classifier. And we have to fill in a couple of um, states. And so we just choose a maximum depth of four, a random state of zero. Um, and then we train the model. Um, the other thing that we have to do, of course, is repeat it. Um, and so we execute the decision tree graph with a maximum depth of four. Um, we're talking or identifying certain levels of feature importance. We're also going to print how well we're doing when we print out the accuracy. Um, and I think, again, you can see the same call for the decision tree classifier. Um, and that's called while it's still in the range of the maximum depth range of four. So, you know, it may not be trivial uh, or obvious, but there's a syntax to calling these things and we've given you that. So the total number of coding lines is just 52. Um, it's not as heavily commented. Uh, we probably should have added a few more comments. Um, training time is very short and to run a test run is, is a couple of seconds. Compare that to the old program, which was uh, 123 lines, which 91 were coding. Roughly the same amount of time to train and to test uh, as the sklearn. Um, but it's roughly twice as long in terms of coding um, to write the old program. So um, you can also test your data. Um, and what we're doing here is we're pointing a function called graphviz. Um, and this allows you to actually visualize the tree, but also um, import things like the feature names and target names and uh, explain how some of the decisions were made. And you'll see exactly what it does. So this is a really useful thing, a really useful function specifically for um, the random forest decision tree components in sklearn. So this is what you get when you graph this. Um, it, uh, if we've taken um, the samples training, um, we can say, you know, anything with a petal width of less than 0.8 centimeters gives us our Gini index. Um, so this is the whole collection at the time. Um, and I think this is just from the training set. So we're using 112. Um, and uh, it makes a split. Um, so if you use that decision of less than 0.8 centimeters, you can get all the ones into Satosa. Uh, and you have a Gini index of zero, which is great. That's very good. And then the ones that are greater than 0 0.8, um, that's um, typically falling with a petal width. I have a Gini index of 0.496, which isn't great. There's 75 samples that fall in there, and that includes both Virginica and Versicolor. Then we make a split and say if well, the petal width is less than 1.65 or 1.75, we can get things uh, very nicely classified into Virginica. Uh, and you can see where the Gini index values are you know, close to zero. And generally, whenever the Gini index ends up at zero, we reach a terminal node. And when the Gini index is more than zero, um, we're able to do some more splits. This is showing you um, the depth. So we start with a full set at the very top. There's four layers, um, starting at the orange one. Um, that's layer one, layer two, layer three, and the very bottom is layer four. And you can see that um, in terms of the, the splitting, all the terminal nodes have Gini indices of zero, which means we've, we've done a, a, a correct job in terms of handling both um, petal length, petal width, um, sepal width um, uh, to make the final classifications. So on that collection of 112, um, we perform perfectly. That's what we can see with the Gini index. Everything was at zero. 
So we correctly predicted the Setosas, the Virginicas, and the Versicolors. That's the confusion matrix in the training set. And then for the remaining, what was it, um, 38, that was the testing set. It's not perfect. Uh, it's perfect for Setosa and Versicolor, but for Genica, we, we get a confusion between Versicolor and Virginica. And there's about 6% that are messed up. If we look at the old code, um, uh, we got the same result with the training. It was perfect. In the testing, um, we were more confused, I guess, on the Versicolor, uh, but it's hard to distinguish between Virginica and Versicolor. Uh, but actually, with the old code, the performance is slightly worse, 93%. This one was 94%. So um, again, it's still a relatively trivial exercise, but the whole point is that you can do this decision tree with uh, SKLearn. And you can save code, and you can get a slight improvement, and you get some great graphics that actually draw out the decision tree. So I've made this analogy before. Um, we spent most of yesterday and part of today learning how to code with the very basic, um, you know, how to walk up the mountain. Uh, with SK Learn uh, and with uh, Keras, uh, you basically get a helicopter to the top. Um, it's a lot easier. Uh, you also get a nicer view. Um, so I, I think that's the point, the central point for um, these two modules on SKLearn and um, Keras, that there are tools and they're not the only tools. We've talked about a few others on, on the first day, um, like Microsoft Azure, um, there's Weka, which is an old one produced by New Zealand. But these are tools that allow people to implement and write uh, machine learning relatively intuitively, uh, relatively easily to you know, generate pictures, uh, to interpret their um, material, and um, to do the work without having to, to you know, get into the nitty gritty of, of you know, hard coding. I'll stop here uh, and maybe ask if there are any questions or comments. Um, but we're going to switch now to the, from the decision tree to the artificial neural net. And we have the same set of slides um, and pathway. And again, it's just the same. Um, what's our problem? What's our data set? We know these already. In this case, we'll be going to the Python code. Um, and this case, we're going to look at the uh, Iris ANN, not the decision tree. And it's with Keras. And we're importing uh, NumPy, Pandas, uh, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. Um, now, this is a case where, uh, as before, um, we're going to upload the data. And we're going to use actually the same, same code that was used in the original neural net one, which is you know, reading the data, making sure there's no missing data, um, flagging if there's any missing data. Uh, we're also uh, assigning things, flattening. We're doing one hot encoding. So this is some extra work that we're, we're building. And so this is something that would have to be in any or every uh, neural net that you're going to use. Um, so it's not quite as powerful, I guess, as the decision tree one, which you, know, you didn't have to do um, your one hot encoding or anything else. Um, so we've done the flatten. We're just still using pure Python. Uh, we don't. Um, we have the the split data set test train. Um, so this is a function we can use. Um, so it's different than the one that we wrote. I think before. Um, but this is where the Keras package happens. Um, so this is where we're importing TensorFlow. Uh, and the Keras layers. And we're bringing in um, uh, specifically uh, dense and specifically sequential. Um, so sequential creates the framework. And then we also bring in uh, something that's a little different. We talked about. Um, activation functions like sigmoidal functions. Um, 
this one is called uh, a rectifier or rectified linear unit or ReLU activation function. And this is one that's uh, used in the hidden layer. Um, and it returns a maximum of zero or the input value. Um, and it's used a lot in uh, neural nets. Um, the um, dense uh, function, which is the architecture of the layer that's added. The add is to add the layers. So are you going to have how many hidden layers or how many? Um, um, how deep is your neural net, if you want? And uh, in this case, um, we put in that the ReLU function is being used as the, both the hidden layer one, in this case, also the, the input function. So these are different than what we used um, for the original neural net. Um, softmax is used um, for uh, the output layer. Um, so I think in our original one, it was sigmoidal um, was used in the, um, was it the input layer. And then I think the hidden layer was softmax. So we're using ReLU and softmax for this one. Um, so this again is just a call and tells us what's using. Again, it's dense, uh, which is um, the function we're having. The, the code that we had, um, if you go back to the neural net that we encoded for um, the iris one, there's about 20 lines. Um, whereas with Keras, it's one line. And this is where we're talking about both softmax and the sigmoidal functions and calculating the derivatives and handling everything else. As I said, we've already chosen our neural net, but then um, with Keras, uh, we do something called compiling. Um, and so there's the compile function, which is called. Um, it's similar to other programming languages that need compilers, uh, like kind of Fortran. Um, and it uses the, the data from the first layers and allows you to choose the optimizer algor algorithm and the loss function. Um, the optimizer function in this one is called Adam, and it's a gradient descent optimizer. And I think you guys have heard about gradient descents. And we went through a lot of the, the derivatives that we were calculating uh, and all the details in the um, neural nets that are sort of excruciating and difficult to follow. Um, this is what's called by just choosing Adam. We're also having a cost function, and this is called cross entropy. Uh, and again, that's also a simple thing. We didn't have to calculate. Um, we just call it and say loss equals categorical cross entropy. Um, and then we're using the accuracy of um, the prediction as our metric, which also is easy to call. Um, we use uh, a fit method. Um, and we have different batch sizes and we have different epochs. And these were also called with quite a bit more code in the original neural net. Um, but remember, we used mini batches and we also had um, epochs. Um, so in this case, we've chosen 10 batches or a batch size of 10, and we've chosen 100 epochs. So um, one line classifier fit does what was done on the left side, which is about 30 or 40 lines uh, within our um, original neural net. Now, I think it's important to remember that we still had to write a fair bit of code at the beginning um, for this neural net, um, where we had to you know, deal with the reading, checking of data, the one-hot encoding. But when it comes to actually invoking the neural net analysis, um, having to do the differentiation, do the you know, forward and back propagation, which was a lot of other code, um, it's reduced to typically a couple lines. So 
so a real win at the, I guess I'll call it the back end of the neural net, but no difference in terms of the front end of the neural net because we have to do all of that um, um, text manipulation and reading and encoding. So we also have a function where we can call predict. Um, that's what we have for all our other programs where we basically have to call our, our neural net uh, or our decision tree to say, okay, here's, I've done my training. Uh, how do I do on my test data? And so we're up uploading our X test data um, and uh, we can compare those um, to, uh, I guess it was my test. So calling things, again, without Keras, it was about uh, 15 lines uh, with Keras testing. It was um, just one line. We can also call Keras to calculate our um, confusion matrix. And this is where we're using Seaborn and we're using the sklearn metrics. Um, and we're able to plot out some of the colors this is where matplotlib is used, and so we can get some nice pictures. Um, we're not going to show them, but this is what you get uh, in terms of results. So uh, without Keras, you can go back to you know, the original result. We had pretty good results overall, um, a diagonal of mostly ones except for the Virginia uh, Versicolor. Um, and then with Keras, um, we're actually slightly worse. Um, we have, uh, as opposed to a one um, at the very bottom, we get a 0.94. But in terms of uh, coding, uh, the Keras one was 136 lines and the Iris ANN was 250 lines. Um, most of those 100 lines in Keras are the text reading and text manipulation. Um, most of the, um, and those same hundred lines are in the IRIS ANN. So realistically, it's about 30 lines of code to do all the neural network stuff with Keras, and it's uh, about a hundred lines for uh, the NumPy version. Um, there's an R version as well. Um, and in this R version, you don't use Keras or sklearn, you um, use something called neural net and um, DP, DPLYR. In terms of runtime uh, with those functions in R, um, you can see that it's quite a bit slower, about five times slower. Uh, when we wrote it in pure R, um, uh, or at least with the decision tree, uh, it's quite a bit faster. So in some cases, this is an example where um, you know, the neural net as a, as a method uh, is one, overkill, and two, less accurate. You know, more code, slower, um, less accurate. Um, in terms of decision tree, uh, it's less code, it's faster, and it's more accurate. But um, this is a, you know, a didactic uh, toy problem. I wanted to be able to show how you could do you know, both decision trees and neural nets. And in many cases, neural nets would be better or better choice for more difficult problems. And, um, but there are also examples where decision trees or at least especially random forests do even better than neural nets in complex problems. And again, it's a matter of try them, see what works. 